All right. All right, everybody, we're really uh, fortunate today to have uh, Dr. Amy Denton, who's a professor in the biology department, come and speak to us uh, today. And Amy has been part of this class, I think, from basically forever. And what she does is she uh, is, knows quite a bit about the history of science. And in fact, we try to twist around the new class in the history of science. Um, and she's going to talk about um, the development of science in, um, in pre-Nazi Germany, but also uh, with a little bit into the Nazi era as well. And give you a sense of what was going on in Nazi Germany and uh, where they got some of their technical expertise from and things like that. So without further ado, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, some of you might know me, most of you probably don't, and uh, I might just scare you away from biology forever with this talk. Um, I'm Amy Denton. I've been at Channel Islands for 15 years. Uh, I study plant evolution using DNA, and I have a particular interest in Arctic and Alpine plants. But I'm also really interested in the history of science. And that, that sort of started out as a hobby for me. Um, but the kind of science that I do is looking at the history of organisms and the history of the Earth. So it's sort of natural to be interested in the history of science. And I'm particularly interested in the history of biology and particularly uh, the development of like uh, 19th century and early 20th century biology. And so that's where this talk sort of comes from. And uh, this, this talk sort of started because we hear a lot about Nazi doctors and the evils of Nazi doctors, and there were many evils of Nazi doctors. There are, these, are, these are just three book titles, there are many, many more, um, and there is no doubt that some horrible things were done to people during the Nazi times uh, using medicine and medical experimentation and science really as a pretext just for, just for cruelty. Uh, but one of the problems that happens is I think people, especially nowadays, people kind of conflate this term Nazi doctor with German science. And those two things are completely different. Um, the United States itself has certainly been, been guilty of highly, highly questionable scientific methods. Some of you might be familiar with the, the uh, United States public health study uh, done in, in conjunction with the Tuskegee Institute that went from the 1930s to the 1970s in which uh, black males with syphilis were studied. And when that study was started in 1932, there was no cure for syphilis. And the idea of this study was just to w look at the disease and, and how it advanced. But within 15 years of the start of that study, a good cure for syphilis was developed, and these men were never given it. Um, that's one of the major uh, problems with this particular study. But these men, and there were 600 of them, 400 of them who had syphilis, 100 of them died, uh, excuse me, 28 of them died, 100 of them died from secondary complications to syphilis, 28 children were born with syphilis, and uh, 40 spouses contracted syphilis. And for most of the study, no treatment was given. These men were tricked into undergoing painful uh, exploratory things like spinal taps, but told it was treatment, and so on. So many, many countries have engaged in questionable scientific experimentation. And what gets lost in all this is the science. And so today, I want to talk a little bit about German science before and during the Nazi era, just, just to help us tease apart this idea of Nazi doctors, bad, and German science, which has really changed the world in ways that you might not really be aware of. Um, and and, and while, we're, while we're disentangling the ideas of Nazi doctors and German scientists, I just want to make an additional uh, uh, disentanglement, which is disentangling sometimes doctors from scientists. And some doctors are scientists, and some doctors are trained in the scientific method. Most doctors are not. They're, they, are, they have incredible knowledge about a, a particular skill. But many times, a, a lot of times when we read about these, these experimentations that were done on people, they were, they were not done by people who were trained to ask and answer scientific questions correctly. Um, 
But anyway, before I start talking about the particular case study, I just wanted to point out some facts about uh, German science. Um, this, these, I have a whole series of graphs, and I apologize for all the graphs, but they, but they relay information in a really useful way, uh, the, the way that scientists do. These two graphs are looking at Nobel Prizes in science, uh, just this ratio between Germany and the USA. And what you can see, and so it's hard to read in the back, this is 1910, uh, the first Nobel Prize I think was awarded in 1909, and this study ended in, in, in 2010. And as you can see, in both cases, the top graph are people who were uh, German citizens, excuse me, this, this, the top graph is, is citizenship at the time of the award, and the bottom graph is citizenship by birth. And so what you can see is that early on, the first, the first half of the decade that Nobel Prizes started, uh, excuse me, the century that Nobel Prizes started to be awarded in, you can see that, that uh, Germany by far had the most relative to the U.S., and in fact, you'll see in a minute, relative to all other countries. Uh, and then somewhere in the 1960s, that switched and the USA started to dominate. And again, this is, this is what countries people had citizenship in at the time of the award. This is a similar graph, but countries in which people were born. And as many of you know, so this period in here, many of the German scientists were recruited very heavily by the United States and other Western powers after the war because uh, the German economy uh, was, was not doing well after the war and, and these scientists were quite skilled. Many, particularly physicists and engineers, people involved in, in rocketry and that stuff were recruited. And, and so that's why there's a difference between citizenship at birth and citizenship uh, at the time of the award. Um, a lot of the, the scientists who were born in Germany uh, moving to the U.S. and other countries. Anyway, just to sort of take a look again, this is the same <coughs> span of Nobel Prize awards from 1910 to 2010s. And what I wanted to point out was just the huge percentage of German scientists, especially early on, especially during the 20s to the 40s, German scientists won the majority of awards, Nobel Prizes in physics. German scientists won a huge majority of the Nobel Prizes in chemistry. German scientists won a huge majority of the Nobel Prizes in medicine. So German science was, was ticking on fairly strongly. And it continues to do so today. I just want to quickly, these last couple of graphs I'm going to show you are graphs that uh, were done uh, through the American Association for the Advancement of Science, our major uh, science, one of our major uh, scientific organizations. This is the group that publishes the journal Science and many others. And this is looking at, at trends in U.S. government spending on science as a, as a percentage of gross domestic product. And you can see that the general trends are a decline. Uh, and this, this graph goes from 1976 to 2016. Uh, as a U.S. spending on science as a percentage of our total budget, again, from 1962 to 2016. And again, really significant decline. What is this huge bump here in the late 60s? Anyone know? The space program. Absolutely. And again, this is just showing uh, The, our basic research funding from government sources is below 50% in the U.S. Now we switch to Germany. This was a study done by the German, uh, uh, excuse me, the journal Nature, and it ends in 2013. But you can see now, and this is not a Nazi times, but you can see now, uh, Germany is committing more and more and more money toward funding science. And uh, German science is doing really well. In fact, Germany is particularly uh, uh, pioneering alternative fuels. Uh, here is a graph that compares a variety of countries looking at re scientific research and development as a percentage of gross domestic product. And you can see Germany is the green line, the US is the red line, and you can see that Germany has now surpassed the US uh, in science funding. <coughs> 
And the most interesting graph of all is this is a graph looking at <coughs> science directed toward defense and science directed toward all other purposes. And you can see uh, red is, is uh, science for, for non-defense purposes, green is science for defense purposes. And you can see where Germany is. Um, 95% of its science, government science funds are directed toward non-defense purposes. Um, the US is here right at 50-50. So Germany is doing a lot with basic research and has done so for many years. Okay. So we're done with the graph part. Now we'll, I want to tell a little science story. So some of you probably don't know that, that uh, education as, as we know it now, higher education as we know it now, uh, was really developed in Germany. Uh, even though the, the modern German state only came about in the 19th century, uh, the tradition of scientific research is much older in Germany. German universities are some of the oldest universities in Europe. This is a picture of the library of the University of Heidelberg. Heidelberg is in 1386. There were other older universities in Europe and in Bologna and Salamanca and Oxford and Cambridge, but German universities are among the oldest. In the early 19th century, German universities underwent some pretty substantial reforms uh, led by one of the Humboldts that really changed the way all modern universities think about education. These early German education reforms, uh, prior to these reforms, higher education, post-college education, uh, people got sort of broad degrees in philosophy and law, and these German education reforms kind of came about from this idea that for people to be productive members of society, to be informed voters and participants um, in their nation's future, they should have uh, useful educations. And Humboldt pioneered this idea of kind of setting up universities so that the academic faculty controlled curriculum and the administrators uh, sort of dealt with personnel and financial matters. Humboldt was also very interested in teaching students real skills as opposed to, to you know, Socratic debate and that sort of thing. And so under these German educational reforms, the first teaching laboratories were set up. The ideas of having a major, you didn't just go to college and sort of read a lot of classic books and, and learn how to debate and learn, learn sort of a general liberal education, but if you wanted to study only chemistry, you could. If you wanted to study only history, you could. Uh, the ideas of, that we take for granted now of having small classes where students uh, worked side by side at a lab bench with a professor, that's new. That came about from these German education reforms. The idea of um, having an advanced degree, a PhD degree, that's a fairly new idea. There didn't, PhDs are, are only, you know, 100, 150 years old. The idea of having for advanced students small seminar courses where there were just a, a few students and the professor instead of large lecture halls like this where everybody just listens. This whole idea of, of, of post-secondary participatory learning real laboratory skills uh, kind of classes is new and it came with industry and finally part uh, came with uh, education reforms and finally partnering with industry uh, particularly in science uh, German, the, the, these German education reforms got students, particularly in, in fields that, that had a natural affinity to industry, like chemistry and physics, they sort of got industry to fund some teaching laboratories, take students as interns, and that sort of thing, which again, goes on really commonly. That model of the research university uh, became accepted worldwide. It was brought to this country, uh, again, only in the late 1800s. Uh, Johns Hopkins was the first university to adopt this model of having PhDs, having majors, uh, getting, doing, doing laboratory science, doing your own research project with a professor. That was brought in to Johns Hopkins in 1876 uh, by uh, the first president of Johns Hopkins, 
uh, Daniel Coit Gilman, who was actually the third president of the University of California. The University of California is slightly older than Johns Hopkins. He was the third president of that. And then he got uh, into arguments with the administration and quit and went on to set up Johns Hopkins in the, the model of these German schools where you could major, do research, <coughs> and uh, get a PhD. And so, so the way that we think of modern universities really comes from the German model. Okay, so that's just my introduction to German science. What I really want to focus on, though, is a case study. And we're going to talk mainly about one German scientist who did something pretty incredible that has had repercussions in all of our lives. And his name was Gerhard Domat. He was born in uh, part of, I think it's probably in Poland now, but he was, he was German. He started medical school as a young man. He was not very far along when World War I broke out and he went to fight in World War I. Uh, I talk to Dr. Bushman and Dr. Bolkin's World War I class about World War I science, and so if you've heard that talk, you're gonna see a couple of slides that come from that because it's important because they shaped what happened to Gerhard Doma. So he was on the front in 1914 in World War I in the trenches, and he got injured and it wasn't a life-threatening injury, but it then kept him out of the front. And he had, he had been, uh, because he had had like a year of medical school, he was a medic on the front. After his injury, he worked in the, in the sanitary service, which he sort of went around to field hospitals and, and sort, of, uh, sort of helped with sanitary conditions and restocking and supplies and that kind of thing. And so he got to see a lot of the treatment hospitals all around um, field operations during World War I, and he was really appalled by what he saw because what he realized was that, and this is true, that in World War I, about as many people died from infection as they did from the actual injuries they sustained in battle. Um, and you can just see, look at where they were fighting World War I, right? They were fighting in these trenches in farmland. Um, World War I wounds were completely different from wounds that had happened to people in battles prior to that. World War I was the first time people, uh, weapons that created shrapnel were used. And so in World War I, you know, if you, if you got a head shot, you died. But what would happen is people who got leg shots and body shots wouldn't necessarily die at first, but they would have these massive wounds Here's kind of a graphic picture. This is a picture of a typical bullet wound prior to World War I. And you see a typical bullet goes through the leg, makes a clean path, and a small exit wound. By World War I, when people were using uh, weapons that generated shrapnel, you get a wound that would just tear up huge amounts of tissue. And these wounds would occur when people were in these trenches in farm fields. What's in farm fields? Yeah, exactly. So people were in these dirty trenches, they were getting massive wounds that tore through their filthy clothes and dragged, you know, manure encrusted soil particles through huge amounts of wide open surface area. And so many, many people uh, got infection. And here's the only really disgusting picture, so I'll, I'll go past it really quickly. But many, many people suffered from gas gangrene which is a bacterial infection in which the bacteria that live in soil, they're soil microorganisms, they get pulled into your uh, flesh and they, many bacteria make toxins as part of their regular metabolism and these particular toxins uh, basically rot away muscle tissue here. I'll, I'll, I'll back up to the slightly less graphic picture. And um, gas gangrene, we can treat it now, but it, it can, could kill you really quickly. When you got gas gangrene, uh, you would, your entire body would become septic and you'd usually die of organ failure within a couple of days and, and the men really, really suffered. And so Gerhard Domacht was, was working in all of these hospitals right on the fighting lines and saw so many men suffering from this condition and it really bothered him. He thought, you know, he, he, he wrote that he could accept that wars would happen and that people would be killed by weapons in wars, but he couldn't accept the fact that science 
couldn't seem to help the people who were injured. If they couldn't be saved immediately by surgery, they almost always died of infection, and that really bothered him. And he vowed to try to figure out a way uh, to, to remedy that when the war was over. So when the war was over, he completed his education. He graduated uh, with a medical degree in 1921, but did not want to practice medicine. He wanted to continue to do research. And uh, he uh, briefly got a job at the University of Munster, but then was recruited very quickly away uh, to one of the large chemical pharmaceutical companies in Germany at that time. Um, and he was recruited by a huge corporate conglomerate called uh, Interessen Gemeinschaft Farbenindustrie, which uh, IG Farben is what it's, 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 uh, was called. It was a huge conglomerate that was kind of formed on the American model of Standard Oil in the 1920s. Uh, and it included what had been uh, Bayer, Bayer, and BASF, and Agfa, and many other German pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and he got a job there, and his job was to do research and to lead a research team specifically, and his goal was specifically to find a cure for infection. Now this company that, I have to sort of backtrack a little bit, this company, IG Farben, uh, which, which, and he was in the, 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 the buyer unit of IG Farben, it, like several other large companies in Germany, were companies that started out using coal tar. And coal tar is this thick, sticky liquid. It's a byproduct of distilling coal to get gas, which was a common process back then. Uh, you would distill coal, you'd get some burnable gasoline, and then you'd have this sticky, disgusting byproduct. And coal tar has some medicinal properties. It's actually used, it's still used today. You can buy it as a drug. It's used in dandruff shampoos and treatment of, of several other skin ailments. But it was essentially a waste product. And in the mid-1800s, uh, mid a, a scientist working with coal tar, trying to figure out what you could do with it, discovered that you could isolate a substance called aniline from coal tar. And then from aniline, you could make all kinds of really strong and bright dyes. And dyes don't seem probably to you to be a big deal. They seem really commonplace. But prior to chemical dyes made from coal tar, the dyes in clothing came from plants and sometimes a couple of animals. But the bright colors in clothing when you have to, to make it from plant-based materials or, or insect-based materials, they fade easily, they're very expensive. The only people who wore brightly colored clothes were the rich who could afford finely dyed materials because they had to be hand collected and they didn't last very long. But taking aniline, this byproduct of, of distillation of coal, you could make extremely bright lasting dyes. Uh, the first dyes were in the blue range. You could get extremely bright blues. And the chemists found that by tweaking some of the side groups on these molecules, you could get bright blues, you could get bright yellows, you could get purples, you could get all reds, you could get all kinds of really bright permanent chemical dyes. And that was huge. And again, it, seems, it doesn't seem like that would be the huge industry of the late 19th century in pharmaceuticals, but it was. And all of these companies, Bayer and, and, and Herx, which is a drug company now, they all started out as part of the huge German dye industry. And almost all uh, artificial dyes were made in Germany by these huge companies. Okay. So, and then these companies now that had set up this, this huge uh, financial research network developing new dyes, began to branch out. And, and very soon after, uh, Bayer, one of the subsidiaries of IG Farben, uh, started working on the chemistry of other natural substances. One of the things that they isolated fairly quickly was aspirin, which is, is a natural product. It, it, was, it was originally isolated from, from, from plants, from willows. But they were the first company to market aspirin. They still do. And they marketed all kinds of other really successful uh, 
synthetic drugs too, including heroin, which was marketed as a cough suppressant, and it is still used as a cough suppressant. But Bayer became a large drug-making firm. But all of their original uh, chemistry and work was based on making slight changes to these aniline dyes that were a byproduct of coal tar. Okay, a couple, just a couple more people, uh, pieces to put into this puzzle. There was a scientist working at, not at Bayer, he was working at one of the other major German pharmaceutical, uh, dye, dye making pharmaceutical companies, Herxt. Uh, his name was Paul Ehrlich, he was an immunologist. And kind of almost by mistake, he was working on something else, but he came up with a drug that seemed to be fairly successful against syphilis. Uh, Ehrlich was known because he's the person who sort of came up with this idea of chemotherapy, and I don't mean chemotherapy the way we think about it as specific treatment for cancer, but chemotherapy in the sense that using a drug to, to, to target an illness as opposed to other kinds of therapy that, that people were using back then. Drugs were not commonly used to treat illnesses. Uh, other kinds of therapy, walking therapy, you know, leeches, trepanation, I don't know, all kinds of things. But, but drugs were just a small part of how we treated disease. And Ehrlich was looking for what he called the magic bullet, a single targeted chemical that would kill whatever was making you sick, but, but leave the rest of the cells intact. And he spent a long time searching for various <coughs> chemical magic bullets that would target specific illness-causing organisms, but leaving people healthy. And he kind of by accident came upon Salversan, which was uh, a treatment for syphilis. And, and at this time, it, right around the turn of the last century, so around uh, 1910, I think, Salversan was first put on the market. By that time, uh, syphilis was a, a pretty serious disease. And it was only treated by having people inhale mercury vapors and other really unpleasant uh, and relatively unsuccessful treatments. And Sobersan, even though it wasn't a huge commercial success, was the first really good treatment for syphilis. And that became, uh, and so he demonstrated by making Sobersan that it was possible to kill specific microbes using a chemical targeted against that microbe. And this was, um, and Sobersan was really one of the first drugs that, that didn't just act by improving your symptoms generally. Aspirin killed pain, but it didn't prevent, you know, it didn't cure a certain illness. Uh, heroin stopped your coughing, but it didn't cure what was causing the coughing in the first place. But Salversan was the first marketed drug prepared specifically for the bacterium that caused syphilis. And after that, uh, and because Salversan did have moderate commercial success and aspirin had success, the buyer branch of IG Farben decided it was going to concentrate on drugs because that seemed to be a new market opening up. And right away, they developed uh, the first synthetic quinine for treatment of malaria prior to, uh, and it was called plasmachin, and prior to that, the only cure for malaria was uh, getting this bark from trees that grew in Peru, and the market for the bark from the Peruvian trees was kind of controlled uh, by a Dutch monopoly. And the Bayer company was able to develop a synthetic treatment for malaria. Following right on that, they developed a synthetic treatment for sleeping sickness. And I should say that both sleeping sickness and um, malaria are not caused by bacteria. They're caused by uh, larger organisms that are easier to treat in some ways because they have metabolisms uh, closer to our own. Uh, bacteria have quite quite a different way of doing metabolism. But they were able to develop these drugs, and they were fairly successful, except by this time, Germany didn't have colonies in tropical places where you might get malaria or sleeping sickness. And so these drugs were not huge commercial successes because Bayer didn't really have a market for them, but they were able to sell them to countries like the UK that did have markets for them. But it was obvious now to Bayer that, that developing chemotherapy, developing drugs targeted to microorganisms that cause sickness was a way to go. 
And then one, one last bit of the story, and then it'll all come together. Uh, this is Ignat Semmelweis. He was uh, a Hungarian of sort of Germanic descent. He was an obstetrician, and he worked in the huge public hospital in Vienna. And he observed, um, it was very common, if you, if you read books about life in the 1700s, 1800s, early 1900s, what was one of the most common ways that women died? Childbirth. Childbirth. And they died from infection, from something called puerperal fever that was an infection introduced post-childbirth. And it was a terrible problem. Uh, it's caused by, a, it's a staphylococcal bacterial illness by infection. And Semmelweis observed, as he was working in this hospital, that there were wards in which women gave birth and they were attended to by midwives. And there were wards in which women gave birth and they were attended to by doctors and medical students. And in the wards where they were, the women gave birth assisted by doctors and medical students, if a woman died in childbirth, they would, because uh, it was a teaching, it was a big public teaching hospital, they would do an autopsy, and the doctors and the students would go right from the autopsy of one woman who died to go delivering another baby. Whereas the women who were on wards where they were delivered by midwives, the midwives weren't in advanced medical training, so the women never did autopsies on dead women, the, women, the midwives just, just gave birth. And some wives realized that women were dying at a much higher rate uh, when they were attended to by these doctors and medical students who went and did autopsies and then went right back into the operating room. And he made a startling suggestion, which is that uh, if you cleaned your hands between deliveries and between doing an autopsy and doing the next delivery, you could prevent puerperal fever, this, this uh, uh, childbed death. And a lot of the doctors and students were sort of offended by that. Uh, and actually, poor, poor uh, Semmelweis, he died at age 47. He, he, he tried and tried to get people to adopt this. They didn't at the time. Uh, he ended up in, 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 he ended up in a mental hospital, and he died kind of tragically. And then not too long after, uh, Louis Pasteur and Lister and uh, several of the, the other uh, French physicians demonstrated you know, bacterial transmission of disease, and he turned out to be right. But what's important for this story is that puerperal fever was a huge problem, and it was a staphylococcal disease. Okay. Now we go back to Gerhard Dolmach. Told you I'd bring it all back together. So he's, when he got his job at IG Farben, again, this was part of really interesting German corporate structure. He was assigned to a team. He was assigned to work with two chemists, Fritz Meech and Joseph Klarer. They were both chemists, and their job was to take this aniline dye molecule and to slightly uh, change the side change, so make slight modifications on the basic chemical structure of aniline dyes. And as they systematically went through every possible change on these aniline dye molecules, uh, Domach's job was to test the biology of it. And he tested these drugs on mice, who were, and, and he was particularly interested in streptococcal diseases. Uh, so he would take mice and infect them with streptococcal diseases. He would also try to isolate streptococcal bacteria from uh, people who had various infections. So he was trying to grow a culture collection of bacteria of streptococcal infections, and he was also, at the same time, taking the, the slightly changed compounds made by Clara and Meech, and he was systematically testing them on strep bacteria grown in, in, in plates, and testing them in mice that were infected with strep. And he, he did really, this, this, he sort of pioneered the use of really careful, laborious lab notebooks saying, you know, today we changed the molecule by, by this sulfur atom in the side chain, we gave it to X many mice, we, gave, we, we introduced it into a bacteria on the plates, they followed what happened to the bacteria on the plates, did they live or die, they followed the mice that were infected, did they live or die. This was, this was really, it sounds, this is exactly how we do research, if any of you have taken science classes, this is what's taught in every school, but this was fairly pioneering, this very regular systematic approach. 
And uh, his goal was, again, to find something that would treat streptococcal infections, because streptococcal infections were the major uh, causative agent in those wound infections that had, that had bothered him so much when he was a medic in World War I. Streptococcal infections are also what causes childbed fever, puerperal fever. Um, and they're also involved in uh, uh, erysipelas or St. Anthony's fire, which is a, a, a bacterial uh, skin disease that was fairly common back then. Some pneumonias, some kinds of meningitis, and scarlet fever and rheumatic fever, which were, which were serious problems at the time, particularly among children and infected the rest of their lives. Um, you know, in the 1920s, strept streptococcal diseases killed more than a million and a half people a year. Um, and that's more uh, than AIDS, cholera, dysentery, and typhoid combined adjusted for, for today's population. They were serious diseases. So that was his goal. And Clarer and Meech would take these, these uh, azo compounds, which were a, a particular kind of, of aniline offshoot, and slightly change the side chains, and then he would test them on mice that were infected with strep and bacteria that he's been carefully culturing on plates. And then in the early 1930s, during one of these routine uh, experiments, Clara and Meech added to this basic azo molecule. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Bushman said he was going to test you on the chemical formulas. Yes. So um, <laughs> uh, one day, one day they, the, the, the particular addition to this basic azo format was uh, something called a sulfonilamide group that contains that sulfur atom right there. And so they were working through the compounds that had this sulfonilamide group. And when Domacht tested this particular drug on mice infected with strep, it seemed to have a, a, a small uh, positive result. And some of the mice recovered. Uh, interestingly, this, this particular sulfonilamide group, when they tested it on the bacteria growing in the plate, it didn't do any good. But it did have some effect, and that, that's an important thing that, that, uh, that Domat didn't quite understand. But he tested it in the, on the bacteria, it didn't do much, but in the mice it seemed to cure them. And then Clara and Meech fiddled with it and fiddled with it a little bit more, and they found a mo another molecule with a slightly adjusted sulfonilamide group on it that had a really positive effect on infected mice. And mice that were infected with streptococcus seemed to recover really well. Um, it had really pretty incredible antibacterial effects. And they named this compound Prontosil. It was patented. And this was the first sulfa antibiotic. And you've probably all heard of sulfa drugs. They're very cheap. They're still used. Um, things like Bactrim and Septra, they're really commonly prescribed for urinary tract infections nowadays. And in developing countries, they are always the first line of defense uh, for, for bacterial illnesses. This was the first antibiotic, and it was remarkably effective. Um, the next three years, Domacht worked on this idea, trying to perfect it and perfect it. And um, his own daughter, Hildegard, uh, cut herself with a sewing needle and got quite st uh, got a, an infection in her arm from doing that and he treated her with this drug and it saved her arm but one of the problems with these drugs is that the sulfonilamide group, the group added to the basic structure is what had the antibacterial effect but they believed they had to deliver this whole compound and the azo group, this, this, uh, this basic aniline dye derivative, was, was something that is, was part of the chemical structure of many dyes. And so when you took this drug, you, these drugs had strong color. And so his daughter, even though her arm was saved, her skin always retained this sort of reddish color. And people who were treated with these earliest sulfa drugs, all one of the side effects wasn't fatal or harmful, but you, you had 
uh, color changes um, in certain areas of your body because this this uh, this dye was given to you. But anyway, this was this was fairly successful. The only problem was this was patented in 1932. By 1932, uh, the UK, the US was not really paying attention to German science, especially German medical science, and so this drug didn't get. Uh, American and British doctors weren't really reading uh, articles written by German doctors, and so this information wasn't getting out to the broader Western world. Uh, however, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's son got uh, very, very sick. I forgot. Forgot he had he had some kind of strep disease, and he was quite ill. And the doctor attending him knew a doctor who knew a doctor who'd read something about Prontosil and and. Roosevelt's son was actually treated with Prontosil sort of under the radar and recovered. And so in certain circles of US medicine, it became well known. Uh, but because there was this sort of you know, growing mistrust of, of Germans and German science, and also because there were no clinical trials or anything like that back then, the, the information about Prontosil was slow to, uh, to spread. However, uh, several uh, groups working in France did know about Prontosil and they decided to get in on it and try to improve it. And so at the Pasteur Institute, a group of scientists led by Daniel Bouvet looked at Prontosil and they made some changes to the basic molecule and by doing that they made an amazing discovery. They discovered that when you gave Prontosil to a mammal to a mouse or to a human, they were, they were working in mice, they discovered that actually the first thing that happens is that the, uh, the body metabolizes Prontosil and only uses part of it. Uh, it, 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 uh, it takes this complicated Prontosil molecule, metabolizes it, and then the active ingredient is something much smaller and easier to use that could be delivered separately. And what they had in effect discovered is this idea of bioactivation, which is a hugely important concept that we still use today. That's when you can deliver a drug in a form that's not active, but then in the body, your body breaks it down into uh, a form that is, uh, that is active, that does what you want it to do, like kills the particular bacteria. And that's a really important concept because there are a lot of drugs that if it, w if it was given to you in its active form would be unpalatable, would have uh, horrible side effects, but if, or, or is just not absorbable. However, if you can find a drug and, and connect it to a molecule that lets it be absorbed, uh, that lets it be palatable, that, that reduces side effects in some ways, then your body's own natural metabolism would then release the active part of the drug from, from the thing that it's connected to that makes it palatable or absorbable or whatever. That's a great thing. And many of the drugs we use, particularly for chemotherapy, are based on this idea of bioactivation, delivering a drug in, in a form that can get in there, then your body breaks it down and the active part works. So, so Bouvet demonstrated this idea of bioactivation, and they actually figured out that there's only one small active part of Prontosil, and they were able to market that, and that got rid of the, 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 the connection to the dyes. One of the other things that came out of, out of, out of the, the Pasteur group was they also discovered how Prontosil was working. And that's also important, because it was the first time they realized what was going on. And what's happening is, is that the sulfonylamide part of Prontosil is what's called an anti-metabolite. Um, and what it does, an anti-metabolite um, inhibits compounds that are part of, of normal metabolism of an organism, in this case the bacteria. And what's happening specifically with, with, with sulfonylamides is that bacteria need folic acid just like we all do. Folic acid is an important building block of, of certain amino acids. Uh, that we need and certain proteins that we need. But animals can make, can use folic acid directly. Bacteria can't. Bacteria can't take folic acid directly. They have to uh, 
use it, they have to, um, they need to take in a compound called PABA, that used to be the thing that was in sunscreens, para amino benzoic acid. They need to take PABA and then break that down and they derive the folic acid from that. And sulfonilamide mimics PABA. So if you give somebody sulfonilamide, if they have a bacterial infection, that bacteria will take up this, this sulfonilamide thinking that it's PABA, but it's not, and then the bacteria can't then break that down into folic acid. So basically, the bacteria are starving to death. So the sulfonilamide drug, the drug that was in the active part of Prontosil, was replacing a compound bacteria needed. Bacteria were taking up the, the sulfonilamide uh, preferentially over the PABA, and then they weren't able to break that down further and not able to, to kill the bacteria. So Domat's Prontosil not only was the first usable sulfa antibiotic to cure infection, but it led to discoveries of two really important concepts that are, that are still key concepts in, in, in drug discovery today, bioactivation and anti-metabolites, substitute, you know, giving bacteria something that they're going to take up instead of something that they need, and then inhibiting metabolic pathways and killing them that way. Um, so to finish up Domlock's story, because it's kind of interesting, uh, he really discovered the first antibiotic. That's, that's huge. Uh, he was successful in, in what he wanted to do. Uh, the Nobel Committee awarded him a Nobel Prize in 1939. Uh, unfortunately, during the period between 1935 and the end of the war, Hitler uh, forbade Germans from accepting a Nobel Prize because uh, he was offended that, that the Nobel Peace Prize was given to sort of an outspoken uh, peace activist. So he was not allowed to accept it. In fact, he did. Domak was, was, was written a letter, a letter came to him from the Nobel Committee you know, saying that he'd won the award, he accepted it, and he was actually temporarily arrested uh, by the Gestapo. Uh, he was released, but he was not allowed to accept his award uh, during the war. But he was finally uh, awarded in 1947 the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. By that time, the, the prize money was gone, but he did end up getting his award. Um, so, so, and he went on to have a successful career. He continued to work on tuberculosis and other diseases as a chemist. But again, he pioneered this really meticulous a systematic way of doing research, and really the first antibiotics. Um, just to finish off with Germany, uh, Prontosil in, in some ways winds back into this whole Nazi doctor scenario, so I'll just I'll sort, of, I'll sort of follow this Prontosil Dolmach thing through all of its, all of the directions it goes. Um, this is uh, Reinhard Heydrich who uh, was a, a, a bad Nazi, and uh, <laughs> he was also kind of a pet of Himmler's. And uh, British special ops uh, tried, in a, a, along with the, the Czech government, tried an assassination attempt in 1942 uh, with a car bomb. Uh, and that was called Operation Anthropoid. And I think, is there a movie? There's two, there are two actual. Anthropoid and one that's H, 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 or something like that, which is better. Because it portrays both sides, Heidrich and uh, the assassin. So it is. It is a well-known event. Um, the the, uh, the 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 British special ops assassination attempt on, and it actually ended up being successful on Heydrich. But um, what happened was he, he, his car blew up. He didn't die immediately, and of course he got an infection, and um, he was quite sick for eight days, and. <clears throat> Uh, Hitler's personal physician suggested that they try this Prontosil drug on him because he was he, he had this infection, he was driving across the field in a car blew up, and uh, the doctor treating him, who was Himmler's doctor, said, no, no, we don't need to do that. And after eight days of suffering, um, Heydrich died. Uh, and, uh, but the doctor treating him, whose name was, was Gephardt, was, was that was sort of a, a bad mark on his career because he recommended strongly against trying this new drug on Heydrich and then he died. And so uh, later on he decided he wanted to try to clear his name and he decided he was going to 
he wanted to demonstrate that, that these drugs really didn't work all that well. And so he set up a trial at the Ravensbrück concentration camp on women. And it was pretty brutal. He, he, he took women prisoners and he broke their legs, thus introducing sort of the kinds of wounds that would get sepsis and then uh, tried treating them with Prontosil versus a variety of other drugs, none of which worked very well because of the, the sort of deplorable conditions in the camps. And so he was never really able to prove anything. But, but unfortunately, Prontosil was used in, in, in this sort of uh, fairly long period of experimentation in a concentration camp in, in a quite brutal way. And there's, there's also been a few books written about um, those experiments in Ravensbrück, because when they broke the women's legs, they, they sort of staggered around and they were, they were called little rabbits, and there are a couple of books written about that. So Prontosil, you know, had, was responsible for some, some really dark things, but also was one of the first antibiotics. Okay, now I'm going to bring this back to the United States. So eventually, these sulfa drugs, after the war, the effectiveness of sulfa drugs, became known uh, worldwide. Now, before the wars, in the United States, there was a, and elsewhere, but particularly in the United States, and you've probably seen these kinds of signs everywhere, there was a huge business in what are called patent medicines. People would make up, you know, Dr. Vulcan's old-timey cure for hemorrhoids, out of you know some squished bugs they found or whatever, and and sell it and and, and they'd advertise widely and that's you know here's here's an ad for snake oil liniment that's where we got the term snake oil salesman which might be a dead term that you guys don't even know but um, this was a huge industry in the U S. Uh, in 1906 we had our first regulation on drugs called the 1906 Food and Drug Act and that. The only thing the, the, the 1906 Food and Drug Act did was said you, um, you couldn't make claims on the packaging that were false. But it didn't say that you couldn't false advertise. So you could put up a million posters saying these magical cocaine toothache drops will give you an instantaneous cure. You just couldn't put that on the actual label of the package. And it also said, that if you say, the, the 1906 Food and Drug Act said, if you say your, your toothache drops contain cocaine, chemical analysis better prove that your toothache drops contain cocaine. So it said you had to have, you had to have the ingredients in the drug that you said were there, which is still part of the law, and that you couldn't make false claims on the packaging. But there were, there were, there, you didn't have to demonstrate safety of the drugs. You didn't have to demonstrate that they actually worked. You didn't have to, there were no clinical trials. Uh, you didn't have to list side effects. You didn't even have to list appropriate dosages. All you had to do was say, if you have heroin or cocaine or snake oil in here, that better be in here. And you couldn't write on the package that it cured things. And in the 1930s, one in 10, one of every 10 healthcare dollars was spent on these patent medicines. And, and even during the depression, this was a billion dollar industry selling these drugs. So the US, so, so the stage that's set here is that the, the US drug industry was sort of this wild you know, place. There were rules, but the rules didn't quite get at the problem. You know, the rules weren't effective in making sure people had safe and effective treatment, but it didn't seem to matter. Um, oh, here's another one, radioactive water. You could sell this. Um, I'm going to wait, wait, hold on. Yeah. Uh, radioactive water actually gets rid of morons and illiteracy, so it's a good thing. But anyway, what happened was that uh, <coughs> sulfa drugs were available in the U.S. You could buy sulfa drugs, and they were in pill form. And they were often the, 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 they were sort of compressed into fairly large uh, pills that were not super easy to take. And so a pharmaceutical salesman for the Massengill Company, which, which we think of now as one that only makes feminine products, but it used to be a, a sort of quasi-pharmaceutical company back in, in the US, 
a salesman there thought, you know, I'm not able to sell our brand of sulfa drugs very well because people don't like taking these big tablets. What if we, instead of having it in these big tablets, what if we put it in a sweet raspberry flavored liquid? Maybe more people would take it if it wasn't this big choking uh, capsule. Now, sulfonilamide is not uh, uh, soluble in water or alcohol, which are the two most common ways of delivering it. But he did find that um, it is soluble in diethylene glycol, or antifreeze, essentially. And so, again, because we had no drug laws, uh, the Massengill Company made 640 gallons of sulfonilamide in liquid form. They called it elixir sulfonilamide. It was basically in antifreeze with, with this sort of sweet red raspberry flavoring, and people took it. And suddenly, in, in, it, was, it was sold in Oklahoma primarily, and in 1937, there were over 100 mysterious deaths reported in Sulfa, in, excuse me, Sulfa, excuse me, in Tulsa. And due to some, even though, due to some pretty amazing and quick detective work, it was very quickly determined, um, and this was, this was, the detective work was done by the Oklahoma uh, Public Health Service, the U.S. Public Health Service. Uh, it was fairly quickly determined that the deaths were all connected by people who took this elixir sulfonilamide, and then it was determined that it's because uh, the, basically the drug was dissolved in, in a poisonous compound, this antifreeze, and the local authorities, the local public health authorities in Oklahoma were able to track down um, of the 240 gallons that were manufactured, they were able to recover 234 of those gallons of, of those you know, before people took it, and the rest of it were, were the, the, the dosages that people took, and so there were a lot of deaths. But that episode triggered the fact that some salesman thought, hey, I can dissolve this drug in antifreeze and make it raspberry flavored and sell it. The fact that somebody could just do that with no checks and balances, and then 100 people died, that is what gave us the modern, that almost immediately in Washington, D.C., we got our, so the deaths were in 1937. By 1938, we had the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, uh, which is modifications of this is what we still go by now. Uh, the, 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 the FDA 1938 Act was the first time we had a law that said drugs must be proven safe and effective before use. Safeness and effectiveness are still the standards of all drug testing. Um, all the active ingredients had to be listed on the label. Um, you had to put warnings about misuse, taking too much, taking too little. Uh, there were stiff penalties for false claim uh, and a few other things. Um, many drugs were taken off the over-the-counter list so you couldn't get cocaine tooth drops or radioactive water anymore. Uh, it also uh, regulated cosmetics, and it gave the FDA uh, the authority to decide which drugs could be marketed or not based on science. But again, one of the most important outcomes that really we still use today is the, the Food and Drug Act, based on something that happened with sulfonilamide, with this protocil that keeps coming back and keeps coming back, was that drugs had to be determined safe and effective. Um, so if we look at the legacy of, of, of Gerhard Domach, German scientist's legacy on, on drug science and his self-discovery, Prontosil led directly to quite a few drugs. Um, as I said, Domach went on to continue to, to study. Prontosil <coughs> led to the first anti-tuberculosis drugs, uh, drugs for high blood pressure, drugs against leprosy. Uh, but even more than that, it led to an understanding of what an anti-metabolite is. And once Prontosil came out, that led to people understanding that the way you want to go about designing a drug, one of the best ways to do it is to make something that can replace a necessary metabolite for the organism, and that's one of the best ways to kill them. So that really defined a strong avenue of drug discovery research. Um, and it, and it, really, it really started this whole, this idea, you know, it, in, in the chemistry department they have courses just in drug discovery. Drug discovery is, is a huge industry here now. How do we design drugs that are targeted? And that, that the way that uh, Gerhard Domacht 
and his chemists had this this you know sort of systematic research method um, was sort of part of that. Uh, Domac established these you know modern research protocols and Prontosil indirectly by its misuse by the Massenville salesman really established our American and now worldwide structure for clinical trials. Uh, the our, when you when a drug company does clinical trials, the first thing they test for is safety, then the next thing they test for is effectiveness. That was all started because of what happened in 1937 based on Prontosil. Um, and it really also, the final legacy of his, of his uh, Prontosil discovery is that it, it sort of established this current business model for drug development. And you know, you can think of that what you want. In, in many ways, it's good. Uh, drug companies have now specific protocols that they follow, that they look for specific therapeutic goals. You know, Domac said, I want to treat streptococcal infections. I'm not going to think about anything else. I'm not going to think about other diseases. I want to treat these. So we're going to, our group is going to focus in on this. That wasn't how pharmaceutical research was done before his time. Uh, and in the years after Prinosil was discovered, the cause of antibiotics, you know, 90% of, of drugs since the 1920s were, were new, you know, from the immediate post-war time. It really revolutionized the kinds of drugs physicians were prescribing. Childhood death rates dropped about 90% from simple infections. The U.S. life expectancy uh, increased. And for many, many, many years, and really true still today, hospital safety was increased. Now, of course, you know what's, a, what's a becoming kind of a serious problem in hospitals now. Antibiotic resistance. Some of these bacteria now are finally getting smarter than the humans, but that's, that's another story. Um, so anyway, all I really wanted to do today was, you know, I can't talk about physics and chemistry and engineering and rocketry and all of the other uh, pretty amazing things that German science introduced to the world, but I thought I would just tell this one sort of interesting story about uh, the first antibiotics because it does loop back to, to so many important aspects of, you know, modern healthcare and pharmaceutical industry and so on. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. And thank you for letting me come and talk to you about Prontosil.